Good afternoon. I'm Patricia Jimenez, teacher librarian and member of the AZLA Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for additional information. Please support AZLA. When you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. The Professional Development Committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your webinar follow-up email. I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. On November 10th, join us for Don't Forget Your Patrons with Memory Loss with Mary Beth Reedner and Tammy Hurst. Research has shown that many people living with Alzheimer's and other dementias can still read and can benefit from using a wide variety of library materials. This webinar will give practical advice about how to choose books and other reading materials that are uniquely suited to each individual following the tenets of person-centered care. In addition, ideas for developing group programming will be shared based on successful programs held in libraries and memory cafes across the country and around the globe. Literacy activities can include reading out loud, browsing through books, singing, choral reading of poetry, word games, and more. Previously held misconceptions will dissolve when you see how positively people living with dementia respond to these opportunities. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona State Library's events calendar, the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Rachel Bridgewater, Karen Grondon, Patrick Newell, Annalie Mon Perry, and Lori Weber for their presentation, Understanding Copyright Education Need in Libraries Leading from the West. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start you off. Um, I'm Karen Grondon. My pronouns are she, her, hers. 
and I am the licensing and copyright librarian at Arizona State University. We want to thank you for coming to Understanding Copyright Education Needs in Libraries Leading from the West, where we'll be talking about research we conducted during COVID. We look forward to sharing some of our findings with you. This project and this presentation was made possible in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We greatly appreciate their support of this work. Next slide, please. So this is what we'll be talking about today. We'll provide an overview of the project. We'll talk about the survey, the results, and findings from that survey and focus group. We'll also talk about our next steps. For the overview of the project, we'll talk about our assumptions and our goals. Our, excuse me, our team, our assumptions and our goals. So for the team, um, our project began when three librarians who are interested in copyright education met at the Kramer Copyright Conference in 2018. And they began to brainstorm copyright education projects in the Western states. Ultimately, those conversations led to this project. Those three librarians were Patrick Newell, a librarian at the Miriam Library at California State University, CSU Chico. Rachel Bridgewater, a reference librarian at Portland Community College in Portland, Oregon, and Annalie Perry, the head of scholarly communications at Arizona State University Library in Arizona. I joined the team later on, invited by Annalie. As our project grew, we expanded our team to bring on our wonderful social scientists, scientists to help us with our data. Lori Weber, who is a faculty member of the Department of Political Science and Criminal Justice at Chico, and our amazing graduate student, Jackie Noble. Rounding out the team, we recruited Max Robinson and Jordan Jedry, library school students in Emporia School of Library and Information Management, who managed the outreach for the project and did an excellent job running the focus groups. Finally, we couldn't have gotten through the project without the amazing administrative support provided by Donna Gauthier, who isn't uh, pictured in this team photo from one of our Zoom meetings. This was and is such an awesome team to work with. Um, presenting today are myself, Patrick, Rachel, Annalie, and Lori. Uh, Max was also going to be here, but he ended up having a last minute conflict. Our basic assumption was that copyright is relevant for all types of libraries and library work. However, effectively and sustainably, sustainably building capacity around copyright in all kinds of libraries is challenging. Most of the existing initiatives around copyright education are managed and developed by institutions and people centered on the East Coast. Our experience led us to believe that different regions of the country may require different approaches to meet this challenge most successfully, which is one of the reasons we conducted this study. So our goals. Our goals were to understand what are the copyright needs. So are there needs that aren't being met and who in a library needs to know about copyright? Next, we wanted to identify obstacles and if our assumptions about those obstacles uh, were correct. So are online training options enough and are there any obstacles we didn't think of? And finally, we wish to use this data to identify strategies for overcoming these obstacles. Should that be more webinars, regional workshops, communities of practice, and how do people want to learn? And now I'm going to turn you over to Rachel. Sorry, finding that unmute button. <laughs> um, hi. So yes, I'm gonna to talk to you about um, the process of developing our survey. Um, so Annalie, Karen, Patrick, and I really started talking about a collaboration in earnest in April of 2019. And at that time really arrived at the realization that we needed some survey data in order to kind of move forward thinking about providing copyright education in the West. Like we needed to know what people needed. <laughs> um, so um, for about a year, we were working on developing the survey 
um, in parallel with working on the grant application with um, the plan that we would try to conduct some version of the survey, whether or not we um, had the grant funded. Um, so when we had a draft version of the survey, that's when we started working with Lori Weber, knowing that we really needed her input as a social scientist to ensure that we were asking the right questions in the right way to get the data that we wanted. And so finally, we had colleagues from all kinds of libraries test the survey out for us. They took the survey and provided us with feedback about what was confusing um, and gave us suggestions for improvement. And we were able to see the gaps um, in the data that we were able to get from the survey. So after all of that development time, what did we ask about in the survey? Essentially, we wanted to know about the people answering the survey and how they interacted with copyright in their work, what opportunities they have to learn about copyright, how much they're called upon to have copyright knowledge, how they feel about it all, like do they feel confident? Um, do they feel like they have the knowledge and support that they need to deal with the copyright issues that come up in their work? Um, what kinds of things keep them from learning more about copyright? And we wanted to know about the kind of support that they got from their institution to get training in general and, in, and about copyright in particular, um, and what kinds of barriers they faced. What would they wanna learn about copyright given the choice and how? We offered people the chance to get a $500 gift card if they took the survey um, and asked in the survey if they were interested in participating in the late the focus groups we had later on. So when we were first getting started with the survey, it became clear that we would need to spend a bunch of time sort of systematically gathering contact information about library organizations and getting like relevant email lists in order to publicize the survey as widely as possible. Our outreach team, um, our wonderful Emporia students created a list in Google Sheets um, as they located kind of the groups and individuals and lists that were active in the survey region. Um, we made a Gmail account to do our outreach with, kind of figuring that this was the best way to track communication, everything going through one email address and making sure that all the, the questions that came in were available to all members of the group. Um, and we distributed the survey in three stages, kind of doing two follow-ups after the initial launch with each lasting about two to four weeks in order to give people enough time to take the survey and ask questions and troubleshoot. Um, the big obstacle we came up with during outreach was actually that group email account, that Gmail account. Um, because it wasn't associated with like a .edu contact. It was occasionally flagged as like a bot or spam by email lists and organizations uh, by some firewalls. Um, making that initial contact uh, with some of the respondents uh, challenging. <laughs> um, the other obstacle that we really found was sometimes it was just hard to find the contact information for some groups. You know, some groups would just have like a contact us form on the email, on the website, which made it hard to get the email address that we needed in order to get the survey out to them. But even running into these obstacles, we were successful in getting contact with a lot of library staff, faculty, and other information professionals from these 13 um, US states that we were looking at. And from that, Emily, next slide. We got a lot of responses. <laughs> um, our outreach efforts resulted in um, 792 usable responses from um, to the survey across the 13 states with participation like roughly proportional to the number of library personnel in each state. Um, and our respondents also included all types of libraries, library workers, and library job functions. And now I will pass it over to Patrick. All right, thank you, Rachel. 
Um, the following slides we're going to be presenting our results in three main areas. Uh, confidence in dealing with copyright issues, the barriers people may explain to, uh, to obtaining or attending copyright education, and some future training needs that people expressed interest in. Um, we also have a subset of this data in its own report just with Arizona data that we can provide later. So what we're presenting now are the 13 states. We do have a report just for Arizona that uh, we can provide to you later. So in this, we measured people's levels of confidence in 12 general library services and 14 different content categories. Uh, we asked people on a scale of one, 0 to 10, with 10 being the most confident about, uh, their, uh, it, about their ability to deal with copyright issues related to different uh, services and materials. Uh, I'll present the results in the next few slides um, after showing you this uh, the instrument, which is on the screen now. What I wanted to point out is that um, the sliders here would allow the person to, the respondent, to choose zero or 10 or anywhere in between. Um, the slider snapped to a, pot, a full number. So we ended up collecting integers and people could rate their confidence uh, regarding uh, interlibrary borrowing or lending by sliding this. Um, in this printout, which is extremely misleading, it seems to indicate not applicable is somewhere on the slider. On screen on the right was a block uh, box called not applicable, and that would not include the data for that question. So we were actually uh, allowed people to say, I just don't do this. It's not applicable to my job. And that data is included. This slide uh, printed out from Qualtrics makes that look really weird. So um, hang with us. We did allow people to opt out with not applicable, and there was a 0 to 10 scale. Um, so on the next slide, we'll start showing some results. So when asked about their dealings with copyright issues related to general library and information services, uh, the highest copyright, highest level of confidence was in open access and or open educational materials and interlibrary borrowing and lending. Uh, these are things that we've had experience with for a long period of time, so it's not unusual the scores would be the highest. Um, but you can see overall that the highest level of confidence people expressed was only a 5.8 out of 10. We'll see that on the next slide. Our next slide includes all the results regarding confidence. What I want to point out is out of 10, even the highest confidence is not really that high. Um, it does indicate that general confidence around making decisions about the use of copyrighted materials is pretty low. Uh, this is about, you know, this is under 60% uh, out of 100%. Uh, one thing worth noting is that the newer topics that we're having to interact with, such as the makers as makerspaces or controlled digital lending, those did score significantly lower. Uh, in levels of confidence from folks. But then there's also other things that we would hope would be a little bit higher, such as uh, digitization and library collections at 4.9 or course reserves and course packs, which is only at 5.0. Um, so as we begin to look at what, uh, what we might be needing, we added things such as makerspace and controlled digital lending, thinking that these are new topics, and we wanted to get an idea of how, how well we were reversed in them. We also looked at uh, different types of materials, content categories. So when asked about their dealings with copyright issues related to general library or, uh, and information services, the highest level of confidence was in open access and or open educational materials and interlibrary borrowing and lending. The other content uh, categories that showed high scores included open educational resources and openly licensed uh, materials, which again, our, our uh, profession has had a lot of familiarity with. We've been involved with this for a while. Uh, we'll look to the next slides where you can see overall at the highest level of confidence for both, uh, both the top scores was only 5.8 out of 10. Uh, 
And when we asked about the dealings with copyright issues related to content categories, uh, unsurprisingly, that's kind of funny, uh, the highest level of confidence was text and documents. We're really good with that stuff. It's been around for a while. We've been figuring this stuff out since 76. Uh, also open access materials. Uh, with this also at the bottom, you'll see things that I wouldn't expect folks would be most uh, uh, familiar with or confident with. Architecture is not something that I run across, have ever run across in my 30 year career um, as a librarian. So uh, data sets and computer code software, those are lower ranked uh, levels of confidence, probably because people don't encounter them that often. Uh, one thing that I think is really noteworthy of this is uh, if you look at the 5.5 government documents, many people assume those are in the public domain, and that assumption alone gives you an idea of how you can use them. Notice that uh, the other items, open educational research, text and documents, we rank higher than that just because we have more familiarity with them. But the, the idea that government documents, something people think, uh, many people think are just available to everyone, even though that is, they're not all in the public domain. Um, it's interesting that things rank higher than that because we seem to understand the government, uh, the public domain pretty well when it comes to these types of um, publications and material types. Uh, we also went on to look at, by job function, uh, which jobs had the highest confidence. This becomes a little problematic, as we'll see in the next slide. But when asked about their uh, dealings with copyright issues related to general library or information services, the highest level of confidence was in open access uh, and or, oh, wait, I'm sorry, were in museum, scholarly communication, and library and information science schools. Um, and our next slide shows the uh, all of these. Now, if you'll notice, we started, this begins with the lowest means and goes to the highest. And we did that because um, we wanted to point out a few things. Uh, we also included the number of respondents and then the standard deviation, because for the uh, math nerds, you're going to like this. Um, so in, the, in a job function of resource sharing, uh, interlibrary borrowing and lending, which is something we do regularly, libraries do regularly, the mean confidence across all respondents was 4.7. Um, we did have 71 respondents, uh, so we had a pretty good response to that. Um, and we've in, uh, highlighted in the yellow here some noteworthy job findings. Uh, these are all pretty publicly facing um, jobs or uh, services. Uh, so interlibrary borrowing and lending, reference and administration and management, all of them being pretty low uh, out of a 10 point scale is noteworthy. We also highlighted these because they had a lot of respondents. So we are pretty confident in those numbers. Um, the lower scores here are, and starting with library vendors and suppliers and youth services and others, uh, indicates where there may be bottlenecks for information about copyright or where people need to learn more if they are interacting with the public, which through our focus groups, we found out a lot of people are doing. Can we take a look at the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, Notice also information literacy instruction is just around 5.25%, even with uh, over 200 respondents. So, um, and the numbers here, we, we'll leave this slide up for a bit so you can look at the different um, uh, means that were achieved. We have highlighted a couple like museum, they ended up with a pretty high score of six point or a high uh, ranking of their abilities at 6.1%. Uh, six, but we only had four respondents. What's kind of interesting for the math nerds out there is the standard deviation, they all answered kind of similarly. So it seems like in museums, they their level of confidence is pretty high. Uh, same with scholarly communication uh, librarians. We had a 
good. Um, so all of you out there can smile uh, because uh, out of 58 respondents, which is pretty good, the second highest score of all of them. And this does make an amount of sense because scholarly communication librarians deal with this information a lot and are having to educate themselves on copyright and how the materials can be used uh, in classes and in publications. All right, one more and I stop talking. Um, the next uh, slide is uh, we did the information by type of organization. And so if we look at the next slide, it includes uh, confidence by type of organization. The means pr present uh, how comfortable personnel with copyright issues. So a lower score may indicate a need for more education and training for these organizations. What's kind of interesting about this is uh, public libraries at 4.39 with a number of uh, high number of respondents indicating perhaps a need for more education for public libraries as a type of organization. Um, I wanted to point out, and we all we all uh, kind of marvel at this, academic uh, and research centers, libraries and colleges, or colleges and universities, uh, are ranked actually lower than school library media centers, um, which is rather interesting. We discovered that school library and media centers do a tremendous amount of interpreting of copyright for copies for classes, for making materials available, and they've uh, they've had to educate themselves uh, around these laws. So it's good to know that there is a bit more uh, confidence there. You'll notice the numbers, uh, like Library and Information Science School, we only had three respondents and they uh, rank themselves pretty high. So having a larger uh, set of subjects might help improve these numbers. But it's it's interesting to see, certainly by, type, uh, by the different breakdowns we've provided, um, what types of confidence people do have. And now as we talk about confidence, I'll I'll turn this over to Lori and talk us about uh, to us about overall confidences. Thank you, Patrick. So, as Patrick mentioned, uh, we uh, asked questions on the survey over twelve different services and fourteen categories. So, there was quite a few questions about confidence. So, what we did is we put it together in an overall confidence measure, where we just averaged people's scores across across all of those categories. And as you can see here at the bottom in the total row, the overall confidence is right there in the middle. You know, not high, but um, not super low, but just right there in the middle. And then we looked at, um, if you look at that first column, uh, we can see the average for people who have had copyright training, and then the average uh, confidence for people who have not had copyright training. So definitely that makes a big difference. And for those of you who aren't statistics nerds, that difference between that three and that 5.59 um, given in the standard deviation is in parentheses is similar. That's actually quite, that's actually quite a big difference um, that training makes in terms of people's confidence, even though it is still overall lower. And then uh, because the academic and public librarians were our big, big response groups, we did uh, break that down as well. So you could just see the differences uh, were fairly similar amongst academic uh, librarians and public librarians. So that is overall confidence. So on to the next slide. We also asked uh, then about the barriers that people have expressed to uh, copyright training. And really the, the big ones that uh, came out of this were lack of available time, lack of awareness of opportunities. What we thought is that geographical barriers were gonna be one of the big ones, but we found that really isn't the case. So if we can see those results in the next slide, geographical barriers is down quite a bit lower, especially compared to uh, lack of available time. Now, we can't do much about time, but the other big one was lack of, of awareness of training opportunities. So this really is an important finding that, that we definitely feel like uh, can, be, can be addressed to, um, to help in, as we move forward with copyright training. And then we did ask um, respondents in it, which areas would they like to receive more copyright training in? And the biggest was um, using uh, in, instructional materials for instruction. That was the highest percentage. Uh, 
So you can see those results on the next slide. Then the, the rest of the items, there was quite a few where it was right around a third of the respondents um, answering across many, and then some of the lower ones uh, uh, that people were interested in were, you know, more specialty type things that people aren't probably coming across as much. Then uh, we asked people, uh, I guess the next slide. Um, we asked people to uh, elicit uh, their views in focus groups. So I will actually turn it over to, um, to the focus group. I think it was gonna be Max, but who, uh, who's presenting the focus group this time is. I'm gonna be doing it. Okay, great. So um, uh, thank you. And you know, we learned so much from the survey, but there's so much you can also learn when you have the opportunities to talk with different focus groups um, and kind of dig a little bit deeper into people's opinions and thoughts and experiences with copyright. Um, so our uh, graduate assistants, Max and Jordan, um, completed training in the February of 2021 um, to ensure that their focus group facilitation was going to be professional, impartial, and unbiased. So this was a great opportunity for them just going to ad lib for a second uh, to get this kind of professional experience in running a focus group. So in the March of 2021, we conducted focus groups with nine different sets of library personnel and each set representing a specific library type. So we included staff at public, academic, school, tribal, legal and government libraries. Um, these were created from a voluntary set of participants who indicated in the survey results that they would be interested in being contacted for a follow up focus group. Um, we also uh, used um, we we compiled and planned out eight different discussion questions to help solicit the best possible responses from our focus group participants. Um, for many of the questions, we showed them some examples of what we discovered from the survey and then gave the opportunity for them to kind of expound a little bit of you know, their thoughts and opinions about the results and then talk a little bit about their own personal experience within their careers, institutions, and regions. So many of the questions in the focus group were talking more about uh, copyright education um, access and awareness and their current comprehension of copyright related inquiries. We did have some obstacles in trying to do the focus groups. I mean, obviously this was very much mid pandemic. Um, we had to conduct them all via Zoom. There were connectivity issues for many people. Um, there was also something that's challenging sometimes with um, trying to have that kind of conversation and relationship on the Zoom platform like we have right here with you today. It's hard, I can't see any of you who are attending. We, it's hard to make eye contact. Um, you don't have the social, social cues about helping to get people to respond or sometimes interrupt one another. Uh, but our moderators did come to the project with backgrounds in radio and marketing, and they did a pretty good job of keeping people together. Um, a perk, however, to doing it over Zoom is it was a lot easier to gather groups of people from all over the Western United States. I mean, we had folks participating from Alaska, California, Oregon, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Colorado. So it was a really great group. So some of our focus groups, um, some of our participants kind of shared a few interesting tidbits aside from even being uh, like, from our results in the in the focus group questions, like, hey, we really liked having the opportunity to talk about copyright to people who cared. Um, they really enjoyed just having a conversation. So that's just a quick little tidbit to share. Um, but we learned a lot of really interesting information. We had hoped that the focus groups would provide the additional information, context, and nuance to supplement our survey responses and we got what we were hoping for. We received a gold mine of information across our nine focus groups, um, bringing breadth and depth to our interpretation of the analysis. As Patrick mentioned earlier, the, uh, or actually Lori did, the lack of time and lack of awareness were the biggest barriers. But when you see here, 
Um, another consideration was the big part of that lack of time and awareness was the need to prioritize copyright education or demonstrate return on investment. Um, so, you know, we have lots, I, I know probably many of you, I mean, you chose to attend this webinar today and probably you could all raise your hand and say, you know, yeah, there are probably three other webinars you could have attended today. There's just so many professional development opportunities out there. Um, so sometimes participants felt the need to understand the return on investment, why to take this training, how it will help me and be able to demonstrate that moving forward. So we felt like there was a common theme of struggling to carve out time or juggle other staffing needs to focus on de professional development and low morale and burnout which is something a lot of us were experiencing and continue to experience in libraries across the profession. Um, remember this was during the pandemic when many places were shut down and libraries were some of the only places open in kind of sketchy ways in some places. So um, that was really challenging. Here's a couple of other interesting um, quotes that we got from some of our participants. Um, we also had some interesting suggestions on what kind of copyright education folks might be interested in seeing. Um, several focus group set members said that the modality didn't matter, like how it was given, uh, beyond practical condition uh, considerations around travel and budget, but they really wanted to know the content and presentation of the mat material mattered most. So was it going to be interesting, engaging, interactive? Um, we liked the idea of like a copyright help line. Uh, that might be fun. So now we're just going to bring us back around about all of the things that we were talking about. Um, aside from wanting to prove that copyright knowledge is relevant to all types of library work, we wanted to check whether our assumptions about the unique obstacles faced by library personnel in the Western U.S. were correct. And here are some of the, the obstacles we thought we'd find. That our larger, less densely populated states may hinder library personnel's ability to attend professional development opportunities that some of our more rural populations may lack reliable or high-speed internet needed to participate fully in online education, that travel would be more restrictive or inconvenient due to factors such as considering the distance from an airport, other libraries, or needing to travel cross-country for conferences, and because of our more distributed population, someone may easily be the only person with copyright expertise, if any, in a state, county, or library system. So were these assumptions correct? Well, a lot of our assumptions were correct. Um, we did know, we did discover for sure that copyright was a need, and this was clearly demonstrated in both the uh, survey and focus group responses. We also discovered, like we thought, that copyright confidence is pretty low across the board, even for areas of library work that might otherwise seem pretty straightforward or well-established, such as interlibrary loan or working with openly licensed content. And confidence levels are low, even for those personnel who have had some copyright training. Um, our top takeaways about obstacles were lack of awareness and lack of time, but Many participants did include inconvenience of available options, distance from training, et cetera. So our assumptions about that was not unfounded. However, it was pretty clear and of no surprise in our COVID area era that the top needs for more copyright training revolve around support for educational activities, the use and creation of instructional materials, understanding open access and open educational resources, and streaming media needs. And common preferences on how to re receive training vary widely, as you might imagine. Training needs are situational, and that maybe something like a training menu could help librarians select the trainings they need. Um, and I'll just mention briefly, like I think looking back, you know, it's been a year, over a year now since we conducted this focus groups and did this research and so many things have changed 
about, you know, now we're having AZLA professional development webinars on a regular basis and an in-person conference. I think it's next week uh, for the first time since we did this study. And, you know, clearly the way we experience training has changed and will continue to change moving forward. So we submitted our report to IMLS after doing all of this work, survey results, focus group, and analysis um, to, in June of 2021. And we took a little break because it was hard conducting a major research study during the pandemic. Um, but we are continuing to work together as we come back to our initial goal to develop new copyright professional development opportunities, particularly within our states and region. In the last couple of years, we have all also facilitated the training of one or more cohorts of copyright first responders. So here in Arizona, Karen and I, along with um, Ellen Dubinsky from the University of Arizona, I think she's on the, the webinar as well, um, have we've now completed two cohorts of copyright first responders. Um, Rachel Bridgewater has been leading the copyright first responders Pacific Northwest, and she's third or fourth, Rachel, and Patrick is uh, on his second, third for Pacific Northwest, and Patrick is also on the second cohort for, that's the whole Cal State, third cohort for the whole California State University system, right? Uh, anyone from California. Anyone from California. So we have all sorts of big ideas of how to kind of merge into a big regional copyright first responders cohort. Um, and also looking for other ways that um, we can increase capacity throughout the West. And we hope that our project can provide a model for other groups and regions interested in exploring the particular needs and barriers in their regions. So we've already started discussions with potential partners on a national level. So we're confident you'll be hearing more from us in the future. But I think at this point, well, yeah, if you're interested in reaching out to us with questions, thoughts, or suggestions later on, you can feel free to contact us. Um, and of course, you can read the full report if you really want to dig into some data uh, at the um, uh, link that we have here. And now I think we're ready to answer questions. And Excellent. one other, one other okay. item about the full report, the entire survey is in there. So if you want to see the instrument we used, all of the different questions we asked, it's all in there. Um, it's in, If you're really interested in copyright or you're having trouble sleeping, it's a great read. Well, we do have some great questions. And of course, um, as the Q&A is going on, please continue to add your questions to the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, we had a question about the training opportunities and how lack of awareness of training opportunities was high on the list of barriers. Uh, are there additional resources for copyright training that people have access to or that's you know gathered in one place? Uh, why don't I start with this and then anyone else? This is kind of an all play. Um, we've, as we've been talking about sort of this regional Western copyright, you know, first responders where we're coordinating training, we also thought it uh, would be good to uh, coordinate efforts around what trainings are available, what sort of resources uh, web pages might be available. Uh, so we're looking at uh, organizing, coordinating those from within copyright first responders, but we're still kind of getting our act together on that. Um, but anyone else? So I could mention I uh, attended the uh, DLF Digital Library Federation Forum earlier this week at which there was a presentation by uh, OCEAN, the Open Copyright Education Advisory Network. Um, and they are, um, I'm going to put the address for their site into chat here. They have some upcoming presentations, uh, webinars. Um, on various topics, uh, including the CASE Act, which is something we didn't address, 
uh, 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 Andy Warhol fair use case, um, gift uh, complex copyright issues and gift agreements, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, and collections management. So there's a lot. They're doing these amazing this amazing work in providing copyright education that is openly available and at no cost to anyone, which is a, a huge positive. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, in regards to other barriers to training, uh, we had a question, what is the difference between uh, distance versus geographical barriers? Both were mentioned on a slide, um, but what's the, what's the granular difference between those two? I think the basic answer is, is there a mountain in your way? Um, uh, uh, basically, we're to, uh, some of the geographical barriers are the Rockies. <laughs> um, you might be uh, not that far mileage wise away, but the travel is simply uh, prohibitive. And that's why we separated those two. Um, we were thinking, well, we're all spread out and there are mountains between us all. Maybe that's a big thing. Uh, I was kind of disappointed that wasn't the case, frankly, but, you know, I try to distance myself, my feelings from the data. You know, it was so much a part of our story, right? Because we'd all had these experiences with like people in our states who, or uh, who, were being prevented from coming to some training by a mountain range. <laughs> um, so it, it definitely went against what we expected to find or a sort of pet theory of ours. <laughs> Interesting. Um, we have um, someone who is interested to know how would they get involved in a cohort? Are there opportunities for people to get involved? That's a really great question. <laughs> so, um, and and here's here's the totally unsatisfactory answer is that currently the copyright first responders model centers around Kyle Courtney, who is the head of copyright at Harvard University, and copyright first responders was kind of his, you know. It, he started it all. And um, we, you know, a variety of groups, and especially those of us here in the West, we're like, well, you're doing it all on the East Coast, Kyle. We need you to come out here and help us build uh, networks in the West. And I think, Rachel, your, your copyright first responders cohort was the first one in the Western US. Is that correct? I think we were the first non-Harvard one. <laughs> oh, right. See? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so arranging new cohorts typically requires getting Kyle in his very busy schedule to come and uh, work with us. Now, in some ways, again, due to the pandemic, that became a little bit easier. He was actually scheduled to come to Arizona for an Arizona for Arizona State University copyright Re first responders boot camp in March of 2020, he had to cancel the Friday before he was going to come because Harvard said no travel. So we had to stop right then, and we we didn't get started until we worked um, with U of A and NAU to have a kind of state universities virtual cohort. And now he's kind of refined that Zoom model and that's made it a lot easier for him. He doesn't have to jet all over the country and it's made it a lot cheaper for us because we don't have to pay for his travel and room and board. Um, and so that's, you know, those are some of the ways, but we all, I think just finished a cohort. And so we still have to plan to move forward for, some new copyright first responders trainings. But one of the things that you know our group is working on is how can we make it so it's not all dependent on Kyle's schedule? Because that's not gonna, it's not gonna suit everybody's needs moving forward. Um, so stay tuned, we will continue to um, 
reach out with other opportunities. And one of the things that we've talked about regarding scheduling is by offering regional a regional schedule for all three or four of our states or as many states on the West, um, we're not further eroding Kyle's time and ability to do this by having three separate ones. Getting one scheduled is going to be a lot easier for all of us. Uh, so we are trying to coordinate and bring on more cohorts and uh, kind of revive and make more active what we already have. But we're still trying to figure this out because we're trying like uh, we're trying to protect the quarterback, Kyle, <laughs> and um, we're figuring out how to do that still. And, and if I could just add on to that, it seems that the state library groups that, you know, AZLA and uh, uh, um, California um, and Oregon systems, that may be a good place for us to promote these uh, cohorts when we do uh, get them started up again. So watch AZLA newsletter for some possible announcements. Wonderful. Um, this is an interesting question that I'm excited to hear the answer to. Um, you mentioned that public librarians with, with training in copyright express less confidence than public librarians without. And just our um, attendee is wondering your thoughts as to why. I think there's a, a too much information on that slide. So, so you can see it up there. They actually did have higher confidence than those who didn't have copyright training. So the public librarians with copyright training, their mean was around five and then about 3.5 for people without training. So too many numbers. In one <laughs> All right. Um, Maybe this is one for each of you to answer, um, but what was the most surprising thing you discovered through this study? Uh, for me, I was really, uh, earlier Annalie mentioned um, that we received comments from people who were in the focus group. Now, the focus group was extremely structured. We asked questions and they people were just answering the questions. We kept it very structured on the questions. Um, I was really struck that for a number of people, we, we showed one response, but we received several from people who, this was the first time they'd had an in-depth conversation about copyright with anyone. So that really kind of uh, stunned me because I was thinking, we're, we're trying to get information from you and this is, and this is your deep discussion of the copyright. Something seems wrong with that. Um, that's my thing to add. What about the rest of us? <laughs> I can go next. I, I was struck by uh, one person in a focus group who said, we closed my library so I could attend this focus group. And to me, that was you know, that, that points out two things that copyright was important enough to her library that, or his or her library, their library that they attend, and that there are a number of libraries that have one to two full-time staff if they're lucky, which makes it even more difficult to, um, to schedule the time and to, to fit this sort of training in. And that's something that we need to, to keep in mind. And I would be interested in learning more about that in a future, in future research. I'll just, uh, I'll just comment that it's, it's funny that this isn't like we thought we were going to be talking about copyright and honestly we th we had a bunch of assumptions like we said about distance and space and our big spread out states like we're always like how oh, arizona is so big you know we're like bigger than half the east coast put together like and, but there's only you know that we're so scattered there's so few of us um but instead of hearing about like those distances i heard here's where the pandemic really came through, but I do think this is, was longer than that really. It was so much about burnout and low morale 
and not having time to do any of these things because everybody's doing so many jobs and wearing so many hats and how hard it is to kind of do a deep dive on anything. Um, and since we did our study, you know, we've learned a lot more about this. There are um, some really great research groups that are studying low morale and library workers that are just, you know, I can't recommend them enough because they're just really amazing. Um, and so, um, and I'll, I'll put a link to that here in the, in the chat for, a, in a minute, but um, that was, you know, to me, that was like kind of a, a touching thing, a non-copyright thing, but it informed so much about what we do and why we can't always learn all the things we want to learn. I'm almost hesitant to say mine because I like that uh, sort of big picture uh, idea so much. But uh, the thing that came to my mind right away as a surprise was um, how equal all the different like modalities for training really were in terms of people's preferences. Like we, I just really assumed, and I would be really, <laughs> I don't think I would have this assumption as strongly now, sort of where we are having gone through these years of pandemic. But at the time it was like, I just assumed people were gonna like really prefer in-person training, but people just said it kind of again and again that like it was really the content that mattered to them and the level of engagement and less like what the exact training modality was. And I thought we were gonna see preferences there. Maybe I'll just quick hop on since I had no assumptions. <laughs> since this isn't my area. Although I'd have to say probably within the first semester as a new faculty member many years ago, I was reaching out to a librarian for help with copyright issues. Um, but I, for me, looking at these confidence levels from the perspective of somebody who also struggles with in having to wear a lot of hats and lacking confidence in the areas that, you know, that we really do need training in and how important it is to have professional training for people that we may take for granted um, as being the experts in everything. And I can't think of anybody more than we think should be the experts in everything than uh, people who work in libraries, <laughs> even more so than people turning to professors. At least they, they think of our areas of being, of subject expertise as being pretty narrow. So that's what was really, um, you know, what I walk away with this is how important, uh, you know, providing that kind of time for training and the resources for that for librarians and for administrators to prioritize that. Excellent. Well, we just have just a few minutes left in our webinar. So I'd just like to ask our panelists, do you have any last thoughts uh, before we go today? Anything that you, a call to action or a, a last piece of information you'd like to send our, our um, attendees away with? I'll be bold and say um, every once in a while we talk about ourselves as copyright warriors <laughs> um, because we are trying to stand up and uh, educate our users about what their rights are and what they can do. And um, that's, I think, extremely important. And the data from this uh, study shows that. Oops. I'll say something unrelated to copyright, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, find your communities of practice and your your good team. Um, we did this really big project under really trying circumstances, and I think we were constantly sort of checking in with each other and being like, "This is my favorite meeting of the month." <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah. In a, as a closing thought, I would say, you know, um, you can do great projects when you've got a good team of collaborators. <laughs> and I'll just chime in with a little AZLA love in that, you know, we, we actually had submitted this proposal to attend last year's AZLA conference in Prescott, and we had hoped to all meet there in person. We haven't seen each other in person, not all together once. Um, since we started working together. Um, and, uh, you know, we're happy to come together again um, here to, 
on Zoom and definitely look forward to meeting again in person sometime. But, um, you know, AZLA is a great organization to have these kind of professional development activities, but also this kind of networking. So um, if you're attending AZLA next week, make sure to meet new people. Um, learn about what people like. And, you know, if you are interested in copyright, um, you know where to find us. We're certainly not the only ones. So you're always welcome to join our happy copyright uh, family. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, presenters. On behalf of the AZLA Professional Development Committee, I just can't express enough how much we appreciate your willingness to share your findings and provide this opportunity to both AZLA members and non-members across the state. And I wanna thank um, all of our attendees today for being with us. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar, along with some of the other materials. I hope you have a wonderful day.